Here we go. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Hudson Jameson. Um, I work for the Ethereum Foundation doing some DevOps and core developer liaison work. Um, actually, let's go, through, I guess, do intros real quick, and then, and then I'll get started on kind of an overview of ProgPal, and then we'll jump into some of the other uh, stuff around it. So that's my intro. Hi, I'm Martin Holstvender, and I work as a programmer on the Get team, and I'm also uh, the security lead for the foundation in, in regards to the Ethereum infrastructure. Hi, uh, I'm Ram from Lease Authority. Uh, we did the ProgPal audit. Uh, I work as a programmer and a security researcher. Hi, I'm Liz Steininger, also from Least Authority. All right, so how many of you in here are familiar with ProgPal? Uh, no. Is that almost, almost, okay. We got at least one person, so I want to explain it. <laughs> um, so, I'll hear some other people coming in. Um, so, uh, ProgPal is, stands for Programmatic Proof of Work, and basically, um, in the Ethereum white paper, it was mentioned that Ethereum was designed to be ASIC resistant. Um, ASIC being a specialized, uh, a specialized hardware chip that's meant to, um, I guess in the cryptocurrency world, mine a specific cryptocurrency algorithm. So um, they're supposed to be ASIC resistant, so there's this thing called ET hash or M hash. People call it different things. And it is um, the, the proof of work algorithm that is used in Ethereum. So when ASICs came online recent, or in the last year, I guess, year and a half, uh, people started to get worried, some people, uh, because there was, because ASICs were originally not supposed to be on the network and there was some concerns from other cryptocurrency communities like Monero and Zcash that ASICs would uh, join the network in a way that was not as altruistic as GPU mining pools or would attack the network or form these secret, you know, mining groups. Uh, and the fact that it would push GPU miners out of the ecosystem. So GPU miners were pretty uh, on not having those in there. Um, so that's kind of where ProgPal came from. A group called If Def Else, uh, who was semi-anonymous, created ProgPal. Uh, the If and If Def Else was uh, Christy Lee Minehan, who's been the spokesperson uh, for ProgPal for this time. Um, the other developers have not been revealed. Since then, there's been a lot of politics uh, and some technical argument on ProgPow in general, um, including some conspiracy theories, some fun, uh, you know, this and that, and back and forth on Twitter. A lot of um, research has been done on ProgPow because of this. I believe it was first made in like March of 2018 that it first started being developed, and we're here now in, I guess, November? When is it? It's November 2019. October. It's October 2019. And um, we're still talking about it, so it's very, I would say it is a contentious topic within the Ethereum community. Um, back when the core developers were deciding whether or not to implement ProgPal, once it was at a point of um, being decided for implementation, uh, the core developers made the decision to implement it into a future hard fork. But because there was all this noise around um, the development of ProgPow itself, the, back in January, the Ethereum cat herders were assigned to um, have some audits done, or basically to organize audits around ProgPow. And we selected uh, least authority for the primarily software part of the hot, uh, audit, and Bob Rao as the um, person doing the more hardware piece of the audit. And those were completed uh, months ago. And um, yeah, I'll have least authority obviously talk about their end of the deal. And um, Martin has been um, helping with the Geth implementation of it and also started a testnet, which he can talk about a little bit. I think it's called Gangnam, right? Yes. Testnet um, for ProgPow to make sure that it is viable um, for the network. So. Um, we'll get into some discussion kind of around a little bit of the technicals, a little bit of the politics, and kind of uh, like reach out to you all to see um, who is um, wanting to ask questions and where you want these topics to go. So I'll throw it to Lisa Authority and then they can throw it to Martin and then we can go from there. 
So, um, yeah, we were selected basically to do this audit, and we know that sometimes, uh, that while well, we knew we were aware that this is a pretty contentious topic, but um, we do see our role as auditors um, to just look and report on what we see. So uh, we, we can't really offer too much in terms of uh, what the community can, should do and how it should handle it and everything, but it was more about just uh, reflecting on what we found with ProgPow. So we uh, looked at it for, I think, a little bit over a month. I think it was about five weeks. And then we produced a report uh, in mid-August, and then I believe it got published towards the end of August or in September, but it's, it's public now. So uh, that report is out there for people to read. Some of the feedback that we've gotten on the report is that People understand it, but kind of don't understand it. <laughs> but it's just because it's really, it's really, we had to get into really technical stuff um, when doing the security audit to really just like dig deep and try to figure out what exactly was going on. Uh, and uh, you know, we report things on a high level, and then we also gave suggestions of what should be um, potentially improved about ProgPow. But I mean, basically, that we found that it, it achieved its goal of um, of making ASICs basically need to be like GPUs in order to um, in order to, to work with it and so that really disadvantaged um, any kind of ASIC uh, production to I mean ASIC advantage um, when they were produced so we also looked at um, what like the so knowing that um, we also wanted to really analyze what would happen if hardware advanced in the future in particular ways how that would also impact ProgPal to also like kind of extend the life of the audit information that we provide to the community. So, um, because you know, there's only so much you can write about like, hey, this is just how it works. <laughs> so we wanted to really look at that. So we tried to capture some things in the report too that said, if this specific hardware advancement happens in the future, then this is the potential issue that might result. And um, more specifically, that was around the um, light evaluation mining. Uh, and then uh, we also uh, had to made a suggestion around the Ketchak function too. And those two items seem to be the ones that are you know most up for discussion, I guess. Um, besides that, we also did some other suggestions there that were also about documentation and stuff like that too. Um, yeah, so you all can read the report for more details, but we're also here to talk today if there's um, any specific questions about that. Yeah, I can just mention the testnet. So there was a testnet started a long, long time ago. I can't exactly remember uh, when it was. Um, it was based on, so Parity had done an implementation which was later uh, merged into the Parity client so it can be activated by Genesis. For Geth, it was never merged into the client. So the Geth clients that participated in the testnet were basically based off a uh, uh, Geth a PR, which by now is kind of stale. Um, as far as I know, the testnet is still up and running and, and the miners are running it. They are also running it on um, dedicated GPU mining. And I don't know at this point how many epochs it has transitioned through, but it's quite a lot. And as far as I know, there's been no uh, problems with it. Yeah, Great. So, um, yeah, that's how I understood it as well. So, um, diving into the politics a little bit, um, the latest on that, I guess, or actually, maybe a bit of background. So, um, there has been some back and forth, just to kind of air this all out there. Uh, Christy Minehan is a very, um, what's the word, magnetic figure, like a controversial figure in the space because of her past affiliations and um, the way she's kind of handled communications and the back and forth that they've had with um, ASIC manufacturers, which I should mention the ASIC manufacturers at times have also been, you know, a little bit like, I guess, rowdy with their communication as far as being anti prog pow, obviously, because they're ASIC manufacturers, they aren't going to want it. So, um, I don't really want to go into like super detail about that, but uh, there's like a lot of interesting articles and back and forth, some Twitter conversations you can dive into to get more information on that. And um, I think that there are two sides to this, obviously, the technical and the political. And the technical has been 
um, fleshed out using the audits and technical discussion, and then the political side has not been fleshed out because there's a lot of very strong opinions from certain people. Um, there's so many sides of the debate. It's even a debate as to whether the community is loud about it, or whether it's just a few very vocal minority uh, groups that are just really loud about it in general. So um, it's really hard to parse the signals out of that. And as someone who's kind of a community manager in the space, this has been one of the hardest things to reason with, is getting the signals from the community about whether or not um, Prog Pow is wanted or needed or things like that. Um, we know the GPU miners' positions. We know some individuals in the community, their positions. We, for the most part, know the core developers' position. Um, uh, you know, the ones who have spoken out for Prog Pow. A lot of it is kind of abstaining from an opinion as well, which is a choice and is something that is important in um, being able to make that choice and that decision when you are in a group deciding something. So um, I think it is a really important discussion. I think that um, for, look, we might want to do this for the panel. We might want to just like have technical questions from the audience or something and discussion. And then if people want to throw in some politic discussion later, which will probably happen because more people are more familiar with that side of it, I think, then that would be cool too. So um, if anyone has questions on more of the specifics that Liz mentioned, um, or any technical questions, feel free. And uh, just, if you don't mind, come up to the microphone so it can be on the, on the recording or whatever. You don't have to show your face, I'll just hand the microphone to you. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions? Yeah, Jeff? I already added you, whatever. <laughs> You've been on camera before. Um, so I, I know we can read the, the report from this authority, but I think like one of the technical questions that I've seen come up a couple of times um, is this notion of like uh, if, if, if the creators of Prague Power are these shadowy figures, like what if there's some secret ASIC ability, you know, in here? And uh, I wonder if you could just kind of like uh, summarize like like basically the rough conclusion of the report on this idea of like um, is it possible that that the uh, um, the developers of the algorithm have a secret ASIC up their sleeves? <laughs> On a high level, not that we could find. I mean, um, security audits aren't a perfect thing. We, we look, we spend a certain amount of time and we look as hard as we can. Um, also, Bob spent, I think, a while, at least weeks, months, <laughs> maybe a couple months. Also, um, Bob Rao, the, who was looking at the hardware, and he really, like, I mean, and our team was communicating with him too, and we really dug into some things, and that's how we came up with even the, the light evaluation uh, that one too, and even that one, we we think is not really an issue either. So, um, and I, I don't know. You want to give a little bit more detail about that one and such? Uh, as far as uh, hardware uh, related, uh, like any secret uh, stuff that any hardware manufacturers can do, um, uh, there there are some um, uh, like a supply chain attack or manufacturing side attacks. Uh, people can do certain things, but uh, uh, as far as this project is concerned, it cannot really affect anything other than produce bad blocks, as we were discussing. Right? Yeah. It's, it cannot really uh, affect anything more than that. It can only just slow down people producing like bad hashes and just slow down things. Um, the other uh, point in the report is the least uh, uh, the uh, light evaluation mining attack, which is possible in the current uh, proof of work algorithm itself with a hash. So probably that's probably of interest to a lot of people. Mm. Uh, so that uh, is like uh, so. Currently, we have the cache, and then a DAG is calculated from the cache. It might be a little closer. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, cache is a small, uh, like 30 MB uh, to start with and just close. And then you have the 
than which is much bigger, like a 4 GB, it starts with four, like a 1 GB or something, and then it grows over time. Now, um, what if uh, you can uh, evaluate the DAG on the fly? So currently the DAG is pre-calculated before a period, and then for the next period, uh, you, you pre-calculate the DAG and switch to it so that you don't suffer any delays when you switch to the new period. So now, um, what if you can calculate the DAG on the fly from the cache? Uh, so for that, you need to store the entire cache on chip. Uh, so right now, the on chip SRAM is very expensive on hardware. Uh, so it's really expensive to put uh, higher. Uh, right now, if you see the current CPUs and GPUs, there are like few kilobytes of SRAM available. Uh, there is also uh, the power equation there. So power to access the external memory is much higher than the power to access the internal memory. So there is a big advantage when things are in the internal RAM. So now, uh, according to Bob, who is an expert in hardware, um, uh, after a few years, maybe four or five years down the lane, maybe 20, 23, 24, we may see uh, higher and higher capacity of S on chip SRAM. On, it will become uh, cost effective to put SRAM, more and more SRAM on the CPU, uh, on, on the die. So that is probably a point where these attacks will be more practical. So there are ways to mitigate that. You, can, you could increase the number of parents that are going into the DAG so that the computation part of it dominates the memory part of it. So because you're also doing some computation, right, to to F and B the values together and then hash them. So you could increase the number of uh, parents that are fetching blocks from the cache. Uh, so that's one way to mitigate that. And also the size of the cache and the diversity. So that would also be working against this hardware advances because on one side hardware is advancing, the, uh, it will become more and more feasible to put the memory more and more memory into the on, on die, whereas um, if you increase the cache size, for example, say, oh, next iteration we are going to have, say, 200 MB or something, so then it will become more difficult to put that. And the cost will work against you to add that. Did I answer? Yeah, that's so, great answer. Thanks. Yeah, that's great. Okay, do we have other technical questions? So when you say that it was a light mining attack, or can, can you, uh, light mining by OSU, can you give like an overview, or was that was that pretty much the succinct? Okay, good. I can summarize. Yeah, that'd be perfect. I can just summarize what it means for our talk. I mean, I guess basically what that means right now is that it's not possible right now that we think it could be possible in five, four to five years, but there is a mitigation strategy that can be implemented now, um, and it also affects eHash. So not just Broadcloud, but eHash too. Well, anyone else? Yeah, sure. I mean, this might be too broad, but I'm just wondering if you give like the like mile high explanation of how Broadcloud works, like on a technical level, if that's not too far to scope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. Dana, you're welcome, sir. I'm welcome, Dano, up here. I think you should try this a little bit. Get on my chair if you want. <laughs> so, PropPow is a variation of eTash. Um, it was, it's I implemented it in Java. It's been a few months, so some of this may be a bit rusty memor uh, from my memory. Um, but, so first you need to get some seed values in your mixers from this DAG, and that's where the main memory access comes from. And then you load those up and you start, I think, 32 lanes, and each one of those lanes, there's like some 16 or 32 things that you do of math, and these parameters change all the time, so I'm sure I'm getting the numbers wrong. But with some of the numbers, you do some math, and to do that math, you also take in each lane stuff from various parts of the DAG all over the place to do that math. And you do this some number of times, you know, there's, there's more cache reads than there are math executions right now. 
Um, so you do this, and each lane is entirely independent. There's like supposed to be 32 lanes, I think, or 16. So each independent lane will take its math from its mixed state, take some stuff from the DAG, do some math together, and then send it to another lane. And you do this about 30 or 40 times. And you get that mixed state together, so it's designed so that the computation is very parallelizable, especially in context of a GPU architecture. And it saturates the whole GPU by using all of the functions a GPU might have, um, except for floating point, because floating point's kind of a murky thing across all the vendors. Integers is, you know, if you can't do integer math, you should get out of computer science. It's, you know, it's pretty simple. Floating points is where things get weird. So they left that out of the spec because it's not certain enough. So you take all that stuff, you hash it together, and at the end you take that final hash date, and you run a final Kachak hash against it. And then that's what you, uh, that's the result of, your, of the hash that you get. And then you do the regular old mining stuff where you check it against the difficulty, see if it's successful enough. If not, you pitch it back. And if you're a miner out there, you have a, a less difficult difficulty you do to prove that you tried and failed. So there's, you know, the, the regular old mining techniques that go on from that. That's a high level overview of kind of what happens. I have code if you want to look at it. So that's also how, how it's implemented in like Go Ethereum and Parity. When you implement this for a GPU, uh, there's also this internal period of 50 blocks, I think, in the... Um, it went down to 10. Yeah, and then it went down to 10 yeah. for, the, for, the, um, <laughs> for the next spec of Progba. Um, and yeah, one of the reasons that the get Progba hasn't been merged is that we're not sure if we should merge the 091 or 09 next. Anyway, so the thing is, on, if you run it on GPU, what you do is that every 50 blocks you recompile the GPU program and you reprogram the GPU for the next 50 blocks. Uh, and that's the kind of programmatic part, uh, this cheat that the GPUs can do but which makes it harder to implement this as a, as a specific circuit in ASIC. Um, yeah. Want to add to that, Julian? Um, you covered the programming, I totally, I mean, I totally skipped the programmatic part, there's so many moving pieces. <laughs> um, but one of the interesting things that one of the implementations found is they actually found a bug in a GPU compiler when they were running the program. And it had a very simple fix. But the thing about these programs is they are the, it's not really random, it's pseudo-random, and the seed is the block number of the period that's going on with it. So you could totally run all your compilations up to, you know, 10 million, 20 million blocks to make sure that your CPU can handle it. So, you know, there's some, there was some concern initially that this might break, um, you know, the CPU things are, are a risk, and any responsible miner would, you know, be running these programs out a day or two in advance to see if stuff blows up, or you know, a month in advance. You know, you just have you just need to have one rig to test to make sure that your stuff works. Awesome answers. All right, any other questions? Um, I just wonder: are are all the is all the controversy non-technical? Are there any technical controversies? And then. Um, I was curious about your description of the test net. It seemed that uh, to me you would want, you'd want to have a very rigorous test net and in some way there was such a rigorous test net. So that was the first, uh, sorry, second question first. Uh, so in general when we set up a test net, try it in your hard fork, what we want is a very lively test net so that we can like for example, for Robston, and then we can execute transaction and see that uh, the execution of transaction still happens uh, the way they would, uh, the way they should, and that there were all consensus. For Progpal, that's totally not needed at all. The only thing that we want to verify is the envelope of the blocks, the, the, the proof of work and the verification and the, the mining of this proof of work. So we totally don't care anything at all about the content of the blocks. So as long as, so what we wanted to do was to get maximum coverage of epoch transitions because we realized that yeah, one, one of the interesting points where things could break is in epoch transitions because that's when the DAG uh, changes. And if I recall correctly, there was, there is some minor tweak to um, improv power which made it um, interesting to just see that we 
would be able to manage um, moving across epochs. And this whole thing about uh, the block period of 50, 50 blocks. So that the, the main concern about the testnet is to have it running over a long uh, sequence of blocks and have uh, GPU minus mine them. And then it doesn't really matter how many clients are on the testnet and not even matters which clients are on the testnet as long as at some point when we take the parity implementation we check that yeah I can import block 0 to 2 million uh, and it verifies correctly it doesn't need to do it in real time as the blocks come along oh, I'll take some of the technical controversy questions that's what I was fairly new to uh, core development when ProgPow was really getting its main push, so I was drawn to that and I want to make sure that, you know, if there were any technical concerns, those got ironed out quick. Um, one of the first problems that it had is the spec is initially written, um, was it really clean room implementable? Um, it was depending upon um, code blocks and test vectors that um, weren't very well spec'd out test-wise. So I went and I implemented it in Java, I had to use C uh, Powell's implementation to get some test vectors out of it to verify, you know, Java's got some of its own issues. It doesn't have um, unsigned integers, which, you know, is where most of my bugs came from. Um, but from those, I was able to create some uh, some unit tests and some data tests for, for transition to prove that you can get the particular blocks. And there's so many different functions. There's, there's a test vector now for each of the functions, and that's what was needed. So I tightened up some of that. Um, and the bit I mentioned about the concern about compiler bugs was another technical controversy, but that is, you know, basically how good are miners at their DevOps? I mean, this is their business. The only thing is there's another thing that they might need to pay attention to, but, you know, the good ones will know what's going on with it. And, you know, these, as long as they're in communication with each other, like, you know, like a lot of them are, um, it's just, you know, it's, it's another thing you gotta worry about that's it's totally within their domain of what they can handle. Um, so I think that covers most of the technical controversies. Were you aware of any others? I think someone said that NVIDIA GPUs were faster than AMD GPUs, um, and I think there was benchmarking done to prove that wrong. Does anyone remember? Is there a change? A slight tweak? Or there was a bugging on AMD or something? Yeah, there was something like that. I think that's where the 093 spec came from, because yeah. they dropped some of the numbers to make sure. And to say that the AMDs and the NVIDIAs are stronger, it's really you want to, because for a particular AMD model, there's like or NVIDIA one is much lower than the other. So the question is, you know, is that the, the NVIDIAs are better at ETASH or the AMD is worse? And, you know, do we make it so it's you got the same sort of adjustment? And it's, it's a lot more within ballpark now between those two. There's no architectural design decisions done that particularly favor NVIDIA or AMD. Not that I know anything about how they do their architectures. The big changes were to take a lot of stuff down to 32 bits. And all GPUs nowadays are 32 bit GPUs. So if there was a 32-bit version of a particular algorithm, that's the one was preferred. And that's why they went to Kachak F800, is because it's 32-bit based. And you put that through a GPU, through the 32-bit integers, those things are like optimized to no end and just blazes right through. So that was part of the decision of why they did a lot of their changes, was to make it optimized for the general class of GPUs, not one over the other. And another technical, I wouldn't say controversy per se, but maybe, question still to be solved is if going from ETH hash, Hashimoto to ProgPow, um, there is still the difficulty, um, so there, Ethereum uses a difficulty formula which is totally dependent on the previous block and if the, if the ProgPow um, hashing engine is half as fast, that means that it will take you quite a bit longer to, to find an appropriately difficult block. So there will be very slow blocks, unless uh, maybe a halving or a, a, a modification to the difficulty formula, the difficult calculation at the point where we switch is made. Uh, so that's still something that can be elaborated with to ensure that like block progresses nicely. Can someone take a picture of all of us before Martin has to leave? <laughs> tweet it. And then tweet it, it just happens. Let's see that one first. 
Right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Okay, and yeah, you got to make your next. No, I'm, I'm already it's already on site. So oh, I already good. pulled them up the up the lead. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, any more technical? Otherwise, we'll jump into political. That'll be fun. Um, there are some things. You mentioned the, the block jump. If we did nothing, it'd take about three or four hours to cut in half. There's also a slight impact on the ice age, and that impact there is it would only be felt like two weeks to a month earlier um, because of the exponential nature of the ice age. And I think there was a third thing related to the, to the bump that might have gone in, but it's it's not too critical. It's every, it's no worse than what happened when they uh, when they thought the transaction rate at the beginning of the gap. It's you know. We communicated ahead of time, it'll be fine. Or if we want to go ahead and do a difficulty cut, combine that with an ice age cut, you know, I think it'll be fine. Oh yeah, right here. Can you talk a little bit about um, the FPGA resistance of ProcPow and if it's you know cost effective to actually try to run ProcPow on FPGA? I think the, we talked about the ten, uh, the period, uh, the fifty blocks, uh, the random math period. Uh, we need to recompile the program like every few blocks. That block period is like too small to really recompile a FPGA program and load it. And furthermore, uh, the, the power requirements in FPGA is a lot more than uh, FPGA right now. So uh, it, it definitely is uh, looking much harder than uh, we were also looking at that. So it definitely looks like it's a lot harder. Uh, yeah, it, it seems infeasible right now. So to add, add a little bit, um, today there exist FPGA accelerators that you can uh, plug into the GPU to offload Kachak. That's a Kachak part, right? Yeah. 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 So to offload the Kachak calculation from the GPU to an FPGA. And so that works really well for ETH. It has, I think, two portions of uh, Kachaking. No, it's not Kachak, is it? It's a... K-E-C-C-A-K? Yeah. Yeah, it's Kachak. I don't say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, So that so using one of these accelerators on ETH uh, can can definitely make it more effective. Uh, and on the ProcPow, it's a lot harder to get that kind of boost from an uh, FPGA accelerator because the portion of uh, power that is spent on that operation is uh, a lot less. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes left, a um, little, uh, little less than that, maybe seven. So let's go into politics, I guess. Uh, so the, for the politics of it, does anyone have any questions or comments? And then everyone looks to vote. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything, I've said what I need to say. Yeah, I have a really general question. Yeah, what is it? Is ProcPad the last mining algorithm that E1.x will ever need? Ooh, was it the last algorithm? So I've heard that they have little like knobs in it that you can like adjust to like make it harder. I, yeah, I don't understand it, but um, you know, for that, that's a question for for the the answer to that is we would need to know the answer of when ETH 2.0 is happening, and even then we need to know all the details, which we're getting really close to having all the details about how ETH 1.0 is going to interface with ETH 2.0. And I believe the latest answer is it's going to be in an execution environment or an EE, um, which will then, I guess, be decided if it will go indefinitely, which it will go for a while still, is my understanding. <coughs> and then um, it might phase out naturally, or there might be a push to move everything from 1.0 to 2.0, where it'll be its own shard. I've, I've heard many different things. Does anyone have any? Yeah. yeah. So my answer to that would be um, <coughs> most likely, but it's really nice if we keep the freedom to say that, hey, we don't commit to anything. We might swap our prog power year from now with something really silly uh, that is trivial to implement in an ASAC. Or we might do something totally different, you'll, you'll never know. Just 
And realistically, yeah, I don't think, I don't think, I mean, if we switch to Propa now, I don't think it will be simple to do another switch later. Uh, obviously, I thought Propa would be kind of uncontroversial and pretty easy thing, and most people would be like, yeah, whatever. So, ah, uh, who knows? <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay. Uh, other questions? Yeah. <coughs> uh, yeah, I just, I didn't know if, uh, you know, it, it, the biggest concern for me is a, is a fork or a contentious fork. So, I mean, is there any evidence, and I apologize, I haven't read the report, that um, ASICs pose a systemic risk to the system, or there is something wrong that, uh, or that poses a systemic risk, or is this just to really appease the GPU miners? Um, and if this is, you know, a short-term uh, thing but before we move to proof of stake, is all of this really, you know, needed to have a potential contentious fork? So my personal opinion has been developing over time on this, and personally, and this is not necessarily a community perspective, but one of the most interesting, I guess, ideas behind this is the fact that right now, the GPU mining pools, the major ones, we know them as in you can go to a chart of them on Etherscan or any of the other block explorers and you can see a chart, pie chart that says like Ethermine and F2 pool and Spark pool. And so we know them. We know that Spark pool has helped out in the community. We know that F2 pool has helped out a little bit. And we know that Ethermine's helped out a lot um, uh, with the technical stuff. So I guess Ethermine would be more technical help. Spark pool would be both technical and community help with their initiatives to do um, stuff in the ecosystem with um, uh, was it, uh, co-working spaces in China and uh, conferences and uh, educational sessions. So we know they're all good actors. The thing with, that I always think back to is Mon in Monero when suddenly there was a lot of hash rate that dropped off after their fork that we had no idea who they were and they didn't know there was a Monero ASIC and it wasn't public. So someone built an ASIC, they started mining on there, and so they could basically do whatever they wanted to anonymously. So as we know all the actors now, if Sparkpool tried to do a double spend, or they tried to, I used to think there might be a way that like they could mess up the 2.0 transition. That is less likely now after talking to Danny Ryan. But um, there are some things that an anonymous large percentage of hash power could do, like double spending right before, because they know that their investment's about to drop off completely. GPU miners can switch to other algorithms ASICs, they're stuck on ET hash or they're stuck on ProgPow. So if we're the only major one implementing ProgPow, then what do, you, what do you have to lose if you're anonymous and just want to do a double spin on an exchange because our confirmation times are much lower? So that's the best argument I've heard so far in favor of ProgPow. So that's kind of where I'm at as far as good arguments go. Uh, and the fact that um, I, I do um, shoot down the idea that um, we made a deal with GPU miners or that because of the um, issuance reduction that there was this implication that we would be doing ProgPow because I know at the time there was some people saying that but I did a huge blog or Reddit post that kind of dispelled that and included timestamps to core developer calls and things like that where we discussed not doing that. So um, as far as is, is there going to be a fork or not, there's no way to know um, and it's going to depend on I guess my, my main opinion on a personal level is that there won't be, because to have a successful fork, you need a dedicated team of developers who can uh, at least code one client, and there would be people maybe from ETC or um, other forks of Ethereum that could pick that up, uh, but I don't see any of them speaking up right now. Maybe if it gets closer, someone will speak up and they'll say, yeah, we're ready to take on a fork of this, and we're very we're against this so much, against the principles of it, that we're going to do it. But I just haven't seen that yet, so it's hard for me to believe. Uh, people underestimated that with ETC. We had never had that before again. So I'm not saying it's impossible at all. It's definitely possible, but I don't know the percentage right now of possibility. No, I mean, if, if that did happen, I'd see that arising organically in that same kind of ETC, you know, uh, kind of way. Yeah. Which is that there's a lot of people who can fork a repo, can run continuous integration, can tweak parameters, may not have the ability to move the, you know, move things forward much beyond that, but they can at least keep the network going. They yeah. can they can do a simple fork and then 
hope to gather, you know, an army behind them, and that's how I'd see, um, yeah. you know, that contention happening. And it could happen in either direction. Mm -hmm. There was actually code. Um, there was actually a developer who was on the discords back in January, February, who was about to do a prod pal fork, and he had code ready and he had dates picked. I don't know why he backed off. Maybe we persuaded him that prod pal wasn't dead, but he was very committed to make it happen. So he actually had code in place and people in place and connections to actually, or he was really good at bluffing, it's hard to tell, without an actual fork. I mean, the other thing that happened at the time of, uh, of, of the down fork is that there was another proposal which was sort of like, okay, let's make a new one. So we're not going to fork, but we want an Ethereum, but, but, we, but we're basically going to start from scratch. We'll make a new genesis. Yeah, yeah. That's that kind of thing is another possibility. So our time is up, unfortunately. I'll be in the hallway to talk more, and Martin has to run. <laughs> so uh, yeah, tag me on Twitter if you took a pic. I'd love to uh, see my face everywhere. I'm very, very <laughs> humble. So um, yeah, uh, thank you all for coming so much. Thanks.